Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Malcolm Bell. I'm the uh, vice chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine here in, in Rochester uh, Mayo Clinic. And I'm very pleased to have with me today uh, my friend and uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Vui Nakomo. Uh, Dr. Nakomo is a uh, professor of medicine and he has uh, joint appointments in our divisions of structural heart disease and our cardiovascular ultrasound uh, division. So welcome, Vui. All right, thanks, Malcolm. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, you're here to, uh, to talk uh, with us today about uh, uh, diagnosing the severity of aortic stenosis uh, in patients uh, who have atrial fibrillation. Um, but perhaps before we talk about the atrial fibrillation aspect of this, uh, perhaps you could just uh, remind our uh, audience, you know, what are the uh, echo uh, Doppler uh, criteria for uh, diagnosing the severity of aortic stenosis? Right. So as you know, Malcolm, aortic stenosis is very common in the general population. And currently, echocardiography is the primary tool that we use for assessing uh, severity of aortic valve stenosis. And the current guidelines um, say a peak velocity of four meters per second or a mean gradient of 40 millimeters of mercury across the aortic valve is consistent with severe aortic valve stenosis. And this will typically occur in the setting of a small valve area, about one square centimeter, or if indexed to body surface area, around 0 0.6 or 0 0.65 square centimeter per meter uh, uh, square meter. So Vui, is, is there a hierarchy in those three measurements you just gave? Yeah, I think the current guidelines emphasize the peak velocity and mean gradient. Typically, a peak velocity of 4 meters per second will correspond to a mean gradient of 40 millimeters of mercury. And so once you have a peak gradient of 4 meters per second or a mean gradient of 40 millimeters of mercury, that is consistent with uh, severe aortic valve stenosis. And the current guidelines will say, irrespective of your aortic valve area. So the aortic valve area, a small aortic valve area, is not a um, necessary um, a criteria to diagnose someone as having severe aortic valve stenosis. As long as the peak velocity and mean gradient meet criteria, then that patient uh, likely has severe aortic valve, uh, aortic valve stenosis. And of course, the valve area is also going to depend on your um, measurement of that outflow tract uh, to, with, with, with some errors. Of Correct. I think there's more. There's more uh, that goes into calculating the aortic valve area, and so there's more chance of error in in doing that. But it's still an important parameter. Sure. And then the uh, the, the peak velocity and obviously the gradient. Um, you in in general, you shouldn't be um, overestimated. It, it potentially could only be really underestimated when using Doppler. Is that correct? Correct. Um, unless you have a falsely high signal, or at least a signal that you think is from aortic stenosis, but it's, a, it's from vascular stenosis. Now, this can be a, a potential problem in elderly patients, particularly when we scan sort of every possible window with echocardiography that we run into vascular stenosis. And sometimes that signal of four meters per second or 40 millimeters of mercury might look uh, uh, like aortic valve stenosis, but it's actually a vascular stenosis uh, uh, situation. So, but as long as you as you get that velocity mean gradient across the aortic valve, you can't really overestimate it. Of course, there's some technical things that you shouldn't overtrace the signal and and so forth. But if you if you get four meters per second, forty millimeters of mercury, well traced a uh, signal across the aortic valve, then this should be consistent with severe aortic valve stenosis. So that all sounds uh, pretty simple and, and straightforward. Uh, so what about the patient now with uh, atrial fibrillation? Because you know, all those beautiful uh, you know, Doppler uh, signals that we see uh, traced out you know, seem to come from patients with good signals, but particularly uh, patients with uh, normal sinus rhythm. So um, how does uh, Doppler echocardiography underestimate uh, severity of aortic stenosis? Right, no, that's a very good question. So it turns out that uh, the major determinants of the gradient across the aortic valve are a valve area as well as forward flow across the valve. And atrial fibrillation, just the rhythm of atrial fibrillation and, and the patient being in the, in the rhythm is associated with a lower forward flow state compared to sinus rhythm. 
Um, and so it means for the same aortic valve area, a patient in atrial fibrillation versus the one in sinus rhythm may not be able to generate the same peak velocity or mean gradient across the aortic valve because of a lower flow state. And some of these patients with atrial fibrillation actually have very low forward flow because in addition to the rhythm being abnormal, which in and of itself is associated with low, low forward flow, some of these patients, especially the ones with persistent atrial fibrillation, will have mitral valve regurgitation as well as tricuspid valve regurgitation from functional atrial enlargement. So they have this functional valvular regurgitation, which then further lowers the forward flow and uh, sort of impedes the generation of a, of a high signal across that narrow, narrowed valve. So obviously, uh, maybe a lot of uh, things at play here. Uh, could, could maybe just focus on the uh, arrhythmia itself here. So obviously, atrial fibrillation, irregular, irregular. So you're going to have some short uh, RR intervals, some uh, longer RR intervals. Walk us through that, how, how that may uh, impact the, uh, the, the signals that you're receiving on, on right. Doppler. Right. So, so that's, a very, that's a very good question. So currently, you know, the work around this issue of variable cycle lengths and variable peak velocities and variable mean gradients is to average about five consecutive signals to get an average of the mean gradient across the aortic valve. And then we use that one to say how severe the aortic valve stenosis is. Uh, but the, in general, just being in atrial fibrillation, as I said, is associated with impaired cardiac function just because of irregular cycle lengths. And so while a patient might have severe aortic valve stenosis with a narrowed valve, some of the signals might be consistent with less than severe aortic valve stenosis, and some of them might be consistent with severe aortic valve stenosis. And that sort of depends on the cycle length and LV filling and contractility and, and all of that, uh, because some of these higher signals are generated from uh, cycle lengths associated with a normal or more no, near normal forward flow, and the lower signals are generated from cycle lengths that are associated with abnormal flow, so lower flow. And the lower peak velocity and mean gradients are not necessarily reflective of less severe aortic valve stenosis. It's just that the patient cannot tell you that they have severe aortic valve stenosis because the signals are coming from these sort of uh, low flow uh, a generating cycle lengths. Um, and so this is where the, the problem becomes. And I think averaging five of those signals uh, um, lowers sort of the, the mean gradient. And so if you have these high signals consistent with severe aortic valve stenosis, if the average falls below the threshold for severe AS, then the patient ends up being labeled as sort of low gradient aortic valve stenosis, while at sometimes they are able to generate these high signals consistent with severe aortic valve stenosis. Would it be fair though that if you had one or two signals that showed that uh, you had very high peak uh, velocities gradients, that that's enough to make the diagnosis of severe aortic stenosis? Yeah, you know, some of us think that should be the case where the highest, single highest mean gradient or single highest uh, velocity should be the one used to determine hemodynamic severity of aortic valve stenosis because when you compare the sort of flow-dependent measurements, like the peak velocity and mean gradients from echocardiography to other uh, measures of severity of AS, like CT scan, aortic valve calcium score, for instance. And we're now also looking at the excised aortic valve weight. Um, the, the highest mean gradient, or the single highest mean gradient, seems to correlate well with the degree of aortic valve stenosis by those other non-flow um, uh, dependent measures of, of severe AS. So, so in the minute or so uh, left to, to us, um, it, so in these patients that uh, it's not clear, you're not getting the, you know, the, those highest uh, signals, um, but you're certainly suspicious of uh, severe aortic stenosis, what, what are the next steps that you're gonna recommend? I mean, it seems as though you need to average uh, at least five, six, seven beats perhaps, but, but if you still don't have your answer there, 
how, how do you uh, reconcile that and what are your next steps? You talked about CT here. Yeah, no, that's a good question. So I, I would say, you know, the, the clues really are in that highest peak velocity and mean gradients. And so once you have this high signals and, and high mean gradients, uh, especially the ones that meet criteria for severe aortic valve stenosis, then you should really think that the patient probably has severe aortic valve stenosis. But the next go-to test for me is a um, CT scan, so uh, computer tomography, aortic valve, calcium score, because they can tell you the calcium load on the aortic valve, and the thresholds are different for men and women because men tend to have more calcium deposition during progressive aortic valve stenosis. And a calcium score of 2,000 or more in men is consistent with severe aortic valve stenosis. And a calcium score of about 1,200 or 1,300 in women is consistent with severe aortic valve stenosis. And so in a situation where you're in a, um, you, are, you have a discordant small aortic valve and a low gradient, ask yourself, is the patient in sinus rhythm or in atrial fibrillation? Because if they're in atrial fibrillation, there's a high likelihood that the patient has severe aortic valve stenosis, at least by calcium score data. And if they're in sinus rhythm, the probability of severe aortic valve stenosis by calcium score is about 50%. Whereas in the atrial fibrillation patient, it's about 80% or more. Are there other tests that you would then go to if you're still unsure? I mean, for example, these patients end up in the cardiac cath lab having hemodynamic studies, or are there other things that you do before that? Right. So the hemodynamic uh, cardiac catheterization is also another important test. Obviously, it also rules out some other things that may be potentially wrong with the patient and causing, and causing symptoms. But in the cath lab, the measurements they get in terms of the uh, gradients are also flow dependent. And we've been in conversation with some of the colleagues in the cath lab about how they actually do that. Echo correlates very well to cardiac catheterization. But if we're averaging signals during the cath lab and also averaging signals during echo, so we, we may both be not doing sort of the right thing uh, uh, by that patient. But yes, cardiac catheterization is another potential test one can use for this. Okay. And then in the patient you know, who may not have uh, any you know, severe underlying you know, heart disease or other significant valvular disease, do you, do you have studies of patients you know, who have an echocardiogram uh, that they're in sinus rhythm and then a short time later they're in atrial fibrillation and then you have the opportunity to measure those uh, Doppler signals and then compare? I mean, could you, uh, it, like it looks as though you, you've, you've been involved in those studies. Uh, could you give us the, the, the findings there? Yeah, I know. That's a, that's a very good question. So, you know, we looked at um, and we published a case series of a few cases that were uh, both. So the same patient was both in sinus rhythm and in atrial fibrillation at two different times within a few weeks, you know, of the, of the studies. And uh, the patients had severe aortic valve stenosis. And it turns out that when they are in atrial fib, atrial fibrillation versus sinus rhythm, the calculated valve error is about the same. But the hemodynamics across the valve when the patient is in atrial fibrillation are much lower. So the peak velocity is lower and the mean gradient is lower because of the stroke volume, the forward stroke volume is lower and the forward flow rate is lower during atrial fibrillation. And when the patient is then cardioverted back into a normal sinus rhythm, the stroke volume index improves, the forward flow rate improves, and the peak velocity and mean gradients go way up and actually meet criteria for severe aortic valve stenosis. And we're actually surprised in some of these patients because the difference in the mean gradients could be 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury difference. Oh, wow. Which is, which is a lot. And so you have someone in atrial fibrillation with low, low gradient aortic stenosis with a normal ejection fraction. And then that same patient, when you cardiovert them, they add about 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury to that gradient. So you can't really say that the patient has, you know, less than severe aortic valve stenosis when they're in atrial fibrillation and that they have severe aortic valve stenosis when they're in sinus rhythm. I mean, that patient has severe aortic valve stenosis during atrial fibrillation. They just can't tell you that they have it because of impaired cardiac performance. 
Yeah, these are these are really important observations of, of yours uh, that uh, are going to be very important you know, for, for managing these patients. And so maybe just in the last 30 seconds here, what are the implications of underestimating atrial, uh, sorry, underestimating the severity of AS in these patients with atrial fibrillation? Right. So good question. I mean, the, so the immediate ones, the immediate consequences would be um, under recognition of uh, of uh, severe atrial valve stenosis, so under detection of uh, severe atrial valve stenosis, and then delayed sort of uh, diagnosis of severe atrial valve stenosis, which will then lead to delayed referral to aortic valve intervention for those patients that that are candidates for aortic valve intervention. And in fact, when you looked at when you look at outcomes in these patients by rhythm, um, in the patients that have atrial fibrillation. Without aortic valve replacement, they do worse than the patients in sinus rhythm. And after aortic valve intervention, be it surgical or TAVR, uh, patients in atrial fibrillation don't do as well as patients in, in sinus rhythm. And part of that is related to some of these things we mentioned, you know, the additional structural heart disease associated with uh, patients in, in, uh, in atrial fibrillation. And when you look at the, the ones that do go for TAVR, for instance, we found that the aortic valve calcium scores are much higher in the patients in atrial fibrillation than in patients in sinus rhythm for a lower peak velocity and mean gradient in the patients that, that are in atrial fibrillation. So, so the mean gradient doesn't really tell you how severe the aortic valve stenosis is and it's much worse than we think it is by the time we refer them for, for aortic valve intervention. Yeah, so maybe just another example that uh, when atrial fibrillation accompanies uh, other heart disease, uh, it uh, has um, really sort of grave consequences uh, unless it's uh, treated uh, appropriately. So, Vui, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to, to, to share the experience of you and, and your colleagues in, in the valve clinic. It's so important. Uh, and uh, I, I think there's a very important uh, number of important messages that uh, you have provided today. So, so thank you so much. All right, thanks, Malcolm.